Louisa was furious when she answered the phone. What the hell do you mean by hello, Louisa? You've got some nerve to be so calm. Your friend Damon came here a few days ago to tell me you were kidnapped. Sabina was with them. She obviously didn't come into the house. It was really thoughtless of me not to call sooner. I apologize. Thoughtless isn't the word, Sophia. You're as inhuman as the monster you live with. Damon told me to call him if I heard anything from the kidnappers. I couldn't sleep half the night. I was so upset I kept calling him. Finally, he found out you were in jail for assaulting a professor. I had to call him again to learn that you were out of jail. Did you think I didn't care what happened to you? Is there anything I can do to make it up to you, Louisa? Nothing. My heart is like a stone. I'll cry. For me, that's very flattering, Sophia. It means you want something from me. That's flattering, too. What do I have that you might want? Everything, Louisa. Love, friendship, help. Get off it. What do you want? Louisa, do you remember Lem Isel? Do you suppose you could reach him? Of course I could. He's living on an estate. I took him there myself. Are you joking? No, but the only way I can reach him is by actually going there. It's an hour out of the city by bus. Is it something urgent? It is to me. Are you busy? When can you be at the bus station, she asked. In 15 minutes. She beamed as soon as I walked into the bus station. What happened to your stone heart, I asked when she put her arms around me. Does it really mean nothing to you that I spent half a night worrying about you? I'm sorry to be so glib, Louisa. That whole affair was so trivial it didn't deserve a phone call. I'm sorry Damon bothered you about it. You look beautiful in that dress. Is it new? Forgive me. You're a rascal, Sophia. Are you going to propose that we walk the streets together? Do you still remember that? How about doing it after we visit Lem? Louisa was really wound up. She acted like a teenage girl who'd just fallen in love, and her pretty summer dress, she even looked like one, except for her wrinkled face. On the bus, she told me, I don't know why you hang around Sabina and her violent friends, Sophia. Your other friends are so nice. Oh no, Louisa, you don't mean Damon. He's a wonderful young man, a professor, and he's close to our movement, too. So he didn't just tell you I was kidnapped? Certainly not. I let that hussy wait in the car for him. He seemed relieved when I asked him to come in. I bet it was love at first sight. What if it was, she exclaimed. I asked him if he was a student. No, he said shyly, a professor. I'd forgotten you were old enough to have professor friends. He told me he'd known you for more than ten years, and that he'd also know Lem and Alec. I asked if you and he were more than just friends, and he said, not lately. When he left, I told him I was sorry you hadn't introduced me to him ten years sooner. I was lying when I told you I spent up half the night worrying about you. I did worry about that night. A little. Louisa... There are a few other things I'd like to tell you, Sophia. Right now? Tell me tonight, while we're walking the streets. How does Lem come to be living on an estate? And what did you have to do with taking him there? That was one of the things I wanted to tell you before we got there. Lem didn't only introduce me to the peace movement. Lem and I became very good friends four or five years ago. He had suffered a great deal because of an errand you sent him on. Is that how he told it? He suffered because of me? He told me he had been very active politically until he was arrested over there while trying to deliver certain messages you'd sent with him. He spent two years in prisons and camps. When I met him, he was still politically conscious, but he was terribly confused. He said the prison experience had opened his eyes, but I'm convinced it fogged his mind. I tried to keep his political interests alive, and for a year I almost succeeded. Almost. I couldn't get him to separate his activities in the peace movement from his growing interest in mysticism. He became irrational. He called it contemplative. He just sat with one leg propped on a table and stared into space. I was disgusted, and of course he sensed that. He started talking about wanting to get away from what he called civilization, about wanting to be alone with nature. He even started to accuse me of depriving him of what he called freedom, of keeping him locked up in a prison of steel and concrete, of separating him from his beloved nature. Fortunately, a friend of his found precisely the thing Lem was looking for, the estate, beloved nature. Do you remember art? Art Sinich? I asked with amazement. I had known Art Sinich during my brief involvement with the peace movement. I saw him again last year in that Committee Against Repression where I also bumped into Louisa, but I didn't know he had any previous dealings with Louisa, and I certainly hadn't thought of him as Lem's friend. There are, after all, at least two million other people in this city. Art was Lem's friend, and he owned an estate? He didn't, but some relatives of his owned one. It had once been the country estate of a famous actor and his equally famous sister. They both died a quarter of a century ago, and the house and grounds have been totally abandoned since then. Weeds and trees have all but hidden what must once have been lovely passing gardens. There are even weeds growing inside the house. When Art described the place, Len begged us to take him there. He accused us of having kept him ignorant of the paradise the gods had created specially for him. So three years ago, we took him to paradise, and good riddance, but you'll see. 
It didn't take me long to see. The country estate was literally abandoned. What had once been the entrance way from the road was a path through a forest. There was no sign that any human being had been in the area for at least a quarter of a century. The path led to the remains of an immense house. The front door was wide open. Louisa went in. I could hardly get past the doorway. The entire floor was littered with several layers of garbage, food, empty wrappers, paper bags, empty boxes, torn books, rags, an old sleeping bag lay in the midst of the trash. I compulsively joined Louisa in the impossible task of trying to pick up and sort the garbage. There's a beautiful kitchen down the hall, Louisa told me. Art had the water connected and even had electricity brought in, but to lend that civilization, and this pigsty is nature. In summer, on clear days, he spends the day sitting on a rock by the pond, always the same rock, until dark. He's afraid of the dark. In winter, he doesn't budge from this room. How awful. Prison can't be worse. I know I feel guilty about the whole thing, but I simply won't have him at my house, and his father wants him put in an asylum. I'm sure that couldn't be worse. But Lem says he likes it here, so why force him into an asylum? His father is filthy rich, you know. Art had a disagreeable correspondence with Lem's father and finally got him to agree to send just enough money to cover the cost of food and electricity plus the cost of hiring a young man to deliver the food once a week. The old bastard spends at least twice that much on a detective who makes sure Art actually spends all that money on Lem. And Lem will talk your head off about how free and independent he is now that he's left rotten civilization. He'll tell you Mother Nature takes care of his needs. But come on, she said, dropping the things he, she'd gathered. Let's at least get some fresh air while we're out here. Watch where you step. He doesn't use the bathroom if he can avoid it. Civilization destroys nature's cycles and all that. But he's afraid he'll get lost if he leaves the path. I walked him up and down the path the first time we visited him, when I realized he hadn't left the house since we'd taken him to paradise. The hermit sitting on a rock was unrecognizable to me. He was as abandoned as the forest surrounding the lake. Hair hung down to his chest. His face was covered by a filthy beard. As we approached him, my heart pounded and my brain incessantly repeated one and the same question. Am I responsible for this? When Lem saw us, he exclaimed, Louisa! But he didn't leave his rock. You're going to take me away! He sounded hopeful when he said it, as if he wanted to be taken away. Away from paradise, Lem? Louisa asked sarcastically. Is Mother Nature mistreating you? If you've come to take me, I won't resist because I know you're only obeying the cosmic will. I'm not taking you anywhere, Lem. I brought you a visitor. Can you try to remember to close the front door of the house when you leave in the morning? That way you won't have to share your food with all the lovely animals. All the creatures of the forest are her offspring, Louisa. You don't understand them. You can't. I'm going for a walk around the pond, Louisa announced. You ought to try it sometime, Lem. If you stay close to the water, you'll come right back to your stone, unharmed. I get scratched. My beard gets all tangled, he said. But then he added, looking up at the sky, I go far, far away from this stone, many planets away. I don't need to walk in circles around a pool of stagnant water. If you love nature, why are you so afraid of it? Her, Louisa asked, walking rapidly away from us. Remember me, I asked, almost shouting. I had made myself comfortable on a fallen tree some distance away from Lem and his path of excrement. I didn't want to decrease the distance because he disgusted me. Nature is clean. Lem was a mound of unnatural filth from the top of the unwashed tangle of hair to the boots which hadn't been re removed for three years. Sure, Sophie, he said without interest or resentment. Still in the newspaper business? Glass business, Lem. I told you that when you were living at Debbie Matthews' house. Don't you remember my visit? I had just sold my newspaper business and gone into glass. I remember you came with your half-sister and her kid. Doing well in the glass business? Oh, marvelously, Lem. You and I wasted our time during all those years in the newspaper business. We should have turned to glass. I own most of the glass factories in this country now, and I'm known as the glass tycoon, but I'm not doing half as well as you are. That's right, Sophie. I'm doing well now, and it doesn't matter to me whether you own the glass factory or just worked in it. I've learned that there are more important things. I've discovered my own inner light. Each one of us has an inner... I interrupted him and asked, Do you remember those letters I had you delivered 12 years ago? I'm sorry about the trouble they caused you. Even that's unimportant now, Sophie. It's important to me, Lem. Why did those letters get you into trouble? Who did you give them to? Whom did you talk to about them? The only address I'd given you was that of the house we had lived in. You told me to ask for someone at that house. I did. The people living there had never heard of him. They told me to ask the police. You didn't take my letters to the police. Of course I did. It was the people's police. At the time, they were comrades. I had nothing to fear from them. 
I identified with them. I introduced myself as a comrade, showed them my card and my invitation to the conference. They weren't at all unfriendly, but in office after office they just leafed through the envelopes and told me they couldn't find any people with those names. Finally one of them recognized a name and gave me an address. Do you remember the name? I didn't know it even then, Sophie. I just showed people the names on the envelopes. Would anything have been different if I had learned all those names? I suppose not. Go on, Lem. He gave you an address. I took a taxi there. It was an office building. The doorman wouldn't let me in. Finally, I said the police had sent me there, and he got polite and led me to an office. I waited and waited. When someone finally came, he recognized the name on one of the envelopes and told me to leave that letter in that very office, since your friend would stop by there later to pick it up. I asked him how I could find the other people. He took all the remaining letters and walked out with them. And you were arrested? No, he was gone a long time, but he returned with the letters. He had put addresses on three of them, and he even told me the order in which I should deliver them so as not to have to pay an extra taxi fare. It's really too bad you don't know any of the names. Can you describe what part of the city you went to? The first address was nearly an hour's ride away from that office building. I'd say the house wasn't in the city at all, but in a much more natural environment. Did the people seem like one-time peasants? They seemed more natural. I don't know what peasants are like. A woman in a black dress and a black kerchief opened the door. I thought she looked afraid of me. She crossed herself as she took the letter. She didn't seem to understand a word, though I spoke to her with my best accent. She closed the door on me while I was trying to tell her the letter was from an old friend of her husband's or her son's. I can't remember which, although I'd been told in the office building. Then the cab took me all the way to the city to what looked like a construction area. There was a row of unfinished houses, but I had to walk a couple blocks through mud to reach them. It was a woman again, with a baby girl. That was Myrna. What was she like? She wasn't friendly either, although she didn't cross herself when she took the letter, and she understood me and heard me out. She told me her husband returned from her very late. She also said she knew who I was and what the letter contained, and she didn't seem very happy about it. Five minutes later, I knew why. As soon as I got into the cab, two plain clothes men got in beside me, one from each side. What did you tell them, Sophie? Why? It wasn't I who excluded you from that omissions paper, but Thurston. I know I shouldn't have gone along with that. I knew it then. That's why I was eager to get out of it all and go to that conference. Lem, please believe me, I didn't send you on that errand in order to have you arrested. Those really were letters to my friends, and I honestly didn't know people could be arrested for delivering and receiving letters. I wanted to believe that, Sophie. It was very hard for me not to believe that. But during the whole investigation and trial, they kept repeating the names of my high school teacher, George Alberts, and they kept asking if I'd known him. Of course I'd known my own high school teacher. They said he was a spy, and that made sense to me. I knew he'd had W. Matthews fired from her job. Who else but you could have told the police that George Alberts had been my high school teacher? Lem, your arrest and Alberts' behavior in the high school had nothing to do with each other. George Alberts and Louisa, you're as unscrupulous as I thought, Sophie. You can't implicate Louisa. Don't you remember I know her? I confronted her with that as soon as I met her. How did you even know that Louisa and I had any connection with Alberts? Did the police tell you that? I knew you must have told them Alberts had been my high school teacher, and that's all I knew then. It was Debbie Matthews who told me. Of course. I saw a lamb seven years ago in Debbie Matthews' house. I hadn't expected to see him there, and my complete surprise had kept me from absorbing a great deal of what he told me. We went there on a weekday night. It was summer. I was exhausted after having sweated all day in the fiberglass factory. I wasn't altogether receptive to Lem's narrative or his presence. This happened a few weeks after I had moved into the house Sabina and Tina had rented. Sabina told me that Jose had supported Debbie financially after Tom, Matthews, and Ron both died. Debbie had never gotten a job again after she'd been fired from high school because of Alberts. After her second visit to Jose in jail, Sabina became concerned about the fact that Debbie was no longer receiving any income from Jose. When she said she was on her way to Debbie's house, I begged to go along. I had liked Ron's mother, and I never really thanked her for having helped me find Sabina after I'd been evicted from the university co-op. Tina also begged to go along so as to see her grandmother again. Tired as I was, I was extremely curious about the relationship Sabina would be able to establish with Debbie. Jose was something like Debbie's adopted son, so I wasn't surprised that she accepted his financial support. But I wondered how willing she'd be to accept money from George Albert's daughter. As soon as we entered the house where I'd almost been shot by Ron's father ten years earlier, I was sorry I'd asked to go along. Debbie answered the door wearing nothing but panties and a brassiere. She reeked of alcohol. She yelled, 
Well, what do you know? Lem, the Alberts girls, all two of them, and Ron's kid. So you've come to finish us off. Behind Debbie, in his underwear, stood Lem Isell, the same Lem who had been my fellow pupil in Debbie Matthews' high school class, the same Lem who had been introduced to the world of tendencies and things by Debbie Matthews. Sabina shoved an envelope into Debbie's hand and said curtly, Jose is in jail. He wanted me to give you this. Sabina was ready to leave, but Debbie threw the envelope at Sabina's feet and shouted, Pick that up and take it with you, Miss Alberts. No one here is for sale. Isn't that right, Lem? Then Debbie turned to me. What are you staring at, dearie? The bathing suits? Don't you know it's the season for them? Isn't that right, Lem? That's right, Debbie, Lem answered. Bathing suits. We don't owe her any explanations anyway, not after what she did to us. What did I do? I asked angrily. Debbie turned to me with flaming hatred in her eyes. You unscrupulous, manipulative bitch. You're ten times worse than that lousy sister of yours. You're Albert's first daughter. You're really good at it. You sure took me in. First I thought there was only one of you, and then she was a two-faced schizophrenic. Then I learned there were two, and the second one was as sweet and innocent as a newborn babe. She's even shocked by bathing suits. But you can't do that innocent act in front of Lem. Show her your wounds, Lem. What did I ever do to him? I asked angrily. Sabina kicked the envelope into the room and started leaving. Tina pulled me by the arm and begged, Don't make a scene, Sophia, please. Can't you see they're both drunk? Debbie shouted, What did you do? Look, look at the gash across his head. Look at his back. Look at his arms. Show her the rest, Lem. Show her what she did to you. Sabina and Tina went out to the sidewalk. I started sobbing. Have you gone crazy, Debbie? I didn't touch Lem. I couldn't have done that. There's no point in your acting so innocent, Sophie, Lem said. I know all about those letters. That was a vicious trick to link me up with George Alberts, of all people. Really vicious. It wasn't until I got back and saw Debbie that I found out what else Alberts was. Your father. After what he did to Debbie, you couldn't have told me he was your father, could you? So you made them think I was related to Alberts. You probably expected me to die there. Why, Sophie? Because of omissions? Debbie said, because you're a worse piece of shit than he is, that's why. At least Alberts never went so far as to pretend to be my boyfriend. My anger returned and I shouted, you're raving, Lem. What happened to those letters I gave you? What did you do with them? They matter to me, Lem. My whole life was in them. Lem answered, they put me through two years of prisons and camps, Sophie. Two years. I told them everything I knew, but they beat me, burned me, cut me for not telling them things I couldn't know. They kept questioning me, transferring me, and questioning me again. But you did something for me, Sophie. Thanks to you, I now know what it's really like over there. It's as rotten as it is here. Thanks to you, my eyes were open, Sophie. Now I see that civilization is at the root of it all. Since I've been back, I've been discovering new ideologies, positive ones, to replace what turned out to be a rotten ideology. I've been studying ancient Egyptian philosophy, and Debbie introduced me to the peace movement. If you hadn't done this to me, Sophie, I think you'd be a, a perfect peace movement person. I always thought of you as a person with an inner light. I was nearly hysterical with fury. I screamed at him, You're lying, you bastard. You lost my letters. You're making this all up because you don't want to admit you lost them. I ran out of Debbie's house crying. I didn't believe a word he told me. For seven years, I remained convinced that he'd lost my letters. But some part of me must have believed something of what he said, because as we walked home, I felt increasingly guilty. I asked Sabina and Tina if they'd heard of the peace movement. Sabina was too uninterested to answer, but Tina said, I've seen them. They sit in front of building entrances and wait for people to hit them. I talked to one of them. They think the more people hit them, the more good they're doing. I didn't miss Tina's sarcasm, but a few weeks later I went to the address on a leaflet Tina brought me and I joined the peace movement. I wanted to feel like I was doing good when I was hit. For several years I had been hit and hit and I'd felt only pain. One of the first people I met in the peace movement was Art Sinich, the young man who helped Louisa transport Lem to the estate. All this came back to me when I listened to the bearded Lem on the abandoned estate. You must have told them Alberts had been my high school teacher. It was Debbie Matthews who told me George Alberts was your father, so you were going to have me put away the way your father had Debbie put away. Lem, you're wrong. You can't implicate Louisa because I got to know her too, Sophie. You're no good. Debbie saw right through you. The first time I met Louisa, I asked her what connection she'd had with Alberts and with my arrest. I learned she hadn't seen you in years. She'd separated from Alberts when we were still in high school, and she disliked Alberts to the point of not wanting to even answer questions about him. Will you let me explain, Lem? It wouldn't do any good, Sophie. Not because you're no good. Maybe Debbie was wrong, but because it's not important. These things are petty, and most people spend their whole lives concentrating on petty things. I've learned to concentrate on... Your inner light. You told me earlier, Lem. 
I saw Louisa returning from the direction behind Lum. I didn't have the energy to begin to explain. I couldn't even bring myself to apologize to that hairy, filthy mystic. I felt disgust and terrible guilt. I was the one who'd made him what he was, that revolting, rag-covered glob. Louisa was all smile. You picked a gorgeous day for your outing, Sophia. She started skipping along the pond and then ran right past Lem towards me. I fell into her arms crying. Everything he told you about me, Louisa, it's all true, every word of it. Louisa pressed my head between her hands and brushed my tears away with her thumbs. Hey, I don't think I like this. I didn't ever intend to hold you that promise. What promise, I sobbed. Your promise to cry for me. I was flattered when you made that promise, but I know it's nothing but a trick designed to prove you're the child and I'm the old woman. I tried hard to smile. My visit is over, Louisa. We were going to go street walking afterwards, remember? Fine, you'll be my mentor. I'm the young novice. Remaining where she stood, Louisa shouted, Goodbye, Lem. Take good care of Mother Nature. And close the front door. Thanks for coming, Louisa. You'll come again? As soon as the inner light tells me to, Lem. She grabbed my hand, and we ran through the forest to the street, avoiding Lem's path. As we walked to the bus stop, I said, Louisa, have you changed, or are you always like this? Whenever I'm in love, I used to hide from you when I was in love. You always spoiled it. Today, for some reason, I enjoy your company immensely. I think I know the reason. I'm finally not your mother anymore, Sophia. That feeling is gone. It's dead. Not a trace of it remains. I like you for the first time in my life. You're like a new friend, an older friend. Older hell, I'll race you to the corner, I shouted, starting to run. Older, older, she screamed, and reached the corner first. You think I'm jealous of your affair or coming affair with Damon, I asked as we climbed into the bus. You can have him. I think he's awful. Sour grape, she yelled, pushing me into a seat. When we got off the bus, Louisa hopped in front of me, spun around coquettishly, and then put her arm through mine and tugged me hurriedly down the street, asking, Do I look like a hooker? Am I walking right? Come on, teacher, start teaching. Louisa, I have a confession to make. Ah, oh, Sophia, don't tell me you've never done it either. What a sad sack. Didn't those friends of yours teach you anything? I suppose you didn't approve. If you're serious about it, Louisa, why are we rushing down the street? Because I'm starving, that's why. I've got all the ingredients for a rice casserole, and I'm inviting my new comrade to be my guest, unless she has prior commitments. No commitments, Louisa. I'd love to come. I haven't been there in years. Good, since you won't tell me any of your secrets, I'll have all the more time to tell you mine. As soon as we were inside the house, I started to run upstairs to my room, but Louisa stopped me halfway. Hey, where are you going? Someone lives there. I climbed back down. Sorry, I stupidly assumed it would always be my room. Is it someone I know? Art Sinich. Art lives in my room? Since when? Since a week after we took Lem to the country. Louisa, did the entire peace movement stay in my room? Just Lem and Art, and it's not your room. I've often thought Prudence would have had a much better name for you. You were named for a Sophia who was reckless, uninhibited, ferociously independent. I thought you'd stop being my mother. I have, sourpuss. That's why I'm having such a good time taking jabs at you. Where will you put Damon? Are you collecting a male harem? You act exactly as I'd feared you would. You're so predictable. But my fear is gone. You're not my conscience anymore. Your conscience? Who made you that? I haven't the slightest idea, Sophia. I didn't. Natchelo didn't. They say that when the children of radicals rebel, they do so by becoming conservative. That's unfriendly, Louisa. I haven't exactly been conservative, and I've always tried to live up to your morals, my pretty. You don't know anything about my morals. I do know I had to hide from them with great care. I hope I didn't spoil all your fun. It didn't spoil much, Sophia. I was careless only once, with Alec. Alec, don't you know he only wanted? You're as red as this pepper. Here, help me put this into the oven. Do you like it spicy? Not too. Fine, then it's ready to bake. I thought you were through with Alec. I was. I couldn't stand him. Then why all this passion? Because I'm your mother? We should have had this scene at least twenty years ago. We'd either have become friends or sworn enemies, instead of this wishy-washy, polite, how are you, nice to see you again. No, I'm not collecting a harem, Sophia. I'm just living my life, and I'm not hiding from you anymore. In fact, I'm having the time of my life showing it to you. Art was fine while the peace movement lasted, but he dried up when it dried up. When he too started talking about his inner light, I asked him to leave. He'll move out this week. Nor do I expect Damon to move in here. Doesn't he have a nice place of his own? I like him, that's all. I get excited just talking to him on the phone. A professor. Professors are beasts, Louisa. Doesn't that conflict with your principles? To like someone because he's an authority? Is that why you're so upset? Help me set the table. I'm not upset. Where do you keep the glasses? On the top shelf, you'll need a chair. Bring down two champagne glasses, too. Champagne? Just for me? Your conscience? We're celebrating my independence. I'm sorry you have to celebrate that. Not your fault, Sophia. I love that man. 
He was my first. I was mad about him, and I wanted to carry his child as well as his name. Now I'm carrying only his name. Salud y libertad to my independence. Am I nothing at all like Nacholo? Not a hair, Sophia. You're as gentle as a lamb, whereas he was violent like Sabina, like Ron. If you insist on that comparison. Then why did you like him? You hated Ron. You hate Sabina. Why did you like them? In high school, you left Lem with his tongue hanging out and ran off with Ron. Explain that, Sophia, and you'll explain why I went crazy for Nacholo. Yes, he was violent. He lived with his rifle. When I met him, he hadn't eaten for days and lived in a rat hole. But his rifle was clean and he had lots of ammunition. Whenever he heard shooting, he ran towards it. If it was workers shooting at priests, state officials, capitalists, or cops, he'd empty his rifle as fast as he could fill it. But if two groups of workers ever shot at each other, he'd risk his life by standing between them and shouting, When workers kill each other, there's no more reason to live. Kill me from both sides. His violence was revolutionary violence. It had nothing in common with Ron's hooliganism. You never knew Ron. Besides, weren't there people in your union who thought Natula was a hooligan? What did George Alberts think of him? Every one of the workers I introduced him to was enthusiastic about him as I was. Louisa, you're hiding part of the picture. Of course, the conservative old union leaders thought he was a hooligan. They considered everyone who still talked of revolution a hooligan. But their influence disappeared on the day of the barricades. Even Alberts became quite violent himself when Margarita died. He joined Natula on the front and nearly died alongside him. They fought for the workers' cause. Ron, Sabina, and their ilk fought for nothing but their own precious selves. Your casserole is delicious, Louisa. Well, didn't they? I don't know, Louisa. I'm confused. Let's talk about something else. When we were arrested 20 years ago, why did the three of us get out of jail after two days, whereas others stayed locked up for four years? That's Yarrowstown's question. What if it is? You've told me George Alberts arranged our release. What power did he have to do that? Why do you ask me that? George became something of a mythical hero during the war. He did some research, I suppose, in physics, though he never told me about any of it. His work supposedly contributed significantly towards the victory. It made him a big man, very influential, with international connections. Everyone knew that, including Yarostan. What do you mean, what power did he have? There was nothing mysterious or secret about the power he had. If they'd left us in jail, he'd have made a big scene in the world's press. Wife and family of wartime physicists arrested, tortured, and whatever else they spiced up those stories with. I despised him by then. During the war, he convinced himself that workers were incapable of carrying a revolution through. He convinced himself all they could do was topple a dictatorship and make room for another, and probably worse dictatorship. By the time we got here, he was an outspoken reactionary. He thought our experience had only proved his reactionary outlook yet another time. Then why did you leave with him? I thought we had no other alternatives, and I still think so. Did Yarostan tell you there were better things for us to do? He spent four years in prison. I only learned that when his letter came this year. At the time, I thought everyone was being released, either a day before us or a few days after. The police told us we'd all been arrested by mistake. It had all been a bureaucratic blunder. And you believe that? Sophia, is the easiest thing in the world to be so smart 20 years after the event. Of course I believe them. I had no reason not to. And you're not one to be asking questions about my clear-headedness during those days. You were old enough to use your own head and draw your own conclusions. And you obviously don't remember just how helpful you were. A 15-year-old girl hanging onto her mother's coat and staring off into space like an idiot who'd lost all her brains. I was so ashamed of you. Sabina's gypsy mother had only been 14 when she died on the barricades. Don't you see you're still trying to hang on to me? Why didn't you do this instead of that, mother? Sabina was only 13, but she knew perfectly well what she wanted. She couldn't wait to leave, and the ship wasn't fast enough for her. If you'd said you'd wanted to stay, you'd have stayed, if you'd only made a peep. I'm ruining your celebration, Louisa. I'm sorry I brought that up. Damn you, Sophia, wipe those tears off your face. Why didn't you cry then? I would have understood tears. I would have left you there if that was what you wanted. But it's that stupid, helpless stare. I couldn't leave you in that condition. I thought you were sick. Don't you dare cry now. It's twenty years too late, and I'm not a bit moved. I don't even feel sorry for you. You've made yourself what you are, Sophia. And if you hate yourself that way, don't start blaming me. Smile, won't you, please? A pretty, friendly smile, as if you enjoyed your comrade's company. Not through tears, you ninny. That's ten times worse. There, that's better. I don't see why you'd hate yourself. To me, you've turned out just fine. You've already led two different lives. You're the rascal, you know that, Louisa? See, I haven't turned out so bad either. Thanks for the delicious dinner, Louisa, and for taking me to see Lem. Let me pour another round before I leave. To our friendship. Bravo, Sophia. There were thousands of other things I'd wanted to tell you. 
then you'll have to invite me thousands of times. It must all sound terribly garbled to you. That Sunday night as I rode home in a taxi, I was determined to start riding you the following morning, before I'd forgotten everything I had just learned. I got home exhausted and slightly drunk, but I couldn't sleep. What Sabina and Louisa had told me about Nachello, Margarita, and George Alberts passed through my mind alongside images of that dirty, bearded hermit who had slept in what had once been my room. The following morning I got up with a headache. I stared at a blank sheet of paper but couldn't concentrate on anything. In fact, I sat and stared all day long. I didn't even thank Sabina when she brought me a sandwich. It was my first completely empty day in years. It wasn't only the previous night's wine nor my headache that made me stare like an idiot who'd lost all her brains. I wondered if I'd really turned out as fine as Louisa had claimed I had, if I had any reason to be satisfied with the two lives I'd led. I suppose she meant my academic life and my life with Sabina, Ron, and their friends. I had lost my teaching job and didn't have prospects of finding another one. It dawned on me that for the past 12 years I hadn't had any projects. All my life I've wanted to create something of my own, something that has meaning to those I love. Yet for the past 12 years I've had only jobs pseudo-projects, activities that use up my project time and my creative energy, but aren't in any sense my own. They existed before me and continue after me. They did more than use up my energy. They were substitutes for the real thing. They pretended to be projects. They filled the gap left by the absence of any activity of my own. They gave me the illusion that I was living while 12 dead years went by. It dawned on me that I hadn't done anything of my own since I'd worked on my novel just before being thrown out of the university and evicted from the cooperative dormitory. I had abandoned that manuscript in the garage and hadn't even seen it again until Sabina brought it with her things two years later when we moved into our house. And I didn't touch that manuscript until your first letter came. For 12 years I had experiences, dreams, and jobs, but no projects of my own. That thought nauseated me. I felt empty. Louisa was wrong. I had every reason to hate what I had made myself, or rather what I had failed to make. I may have looked like an idiot, but I was lucid for the first time in 12 years, and I was frightened. Fortunately, early the next morning, a week ago yesterday, Tina saved me from the fright and from the lucidity as well. She came to tell Sabina and me that something very much like a revolution was breaking out. I thought you'd both be interested, she said. Turning to Sabina, she added, Ted thinks this might be the beginning of something big, something you all used to talk about in the garage. In a university building, Sabina asked sarcastically. It's not a university anymore, Sabina. The students aren't students anymore, but just people. Workers have been coming from all over the city, and they're no longer workers. They're just people, too. And they're all talking to each other. I've never seen so many people so excited. Ted thinks something big is possible. I think anything at all is possible. It's what both of you have always looked forward to. Everything is always possible when it isn't real, Sabina said. Stay home, then. It won't be my fault. Ted is so sure it's real he's trying to get Tissy out of the state hospital on parole. He wants her to be in on it. Damn it, Tina, don't just stand there. Call a cab. Ted knew you'd come, Sabina. He wants you to be at the hospital with him when Tizzy comes out. He thinks she'll be less frightened if you're there. You can both stay at Ted's. I'm staying in the commune. Don't waste my time arguing, Tina. I've got to pack. I told Tina hesitantly. I'd rather not stay at Ted's. That's real news, Sophia. Hear that, Sabina? She'd rather not stay at Ted's. Why have you kept it from us all these years, Sophia? We all thought you were crazy about Ted. I'll just stay here and I'll go there every morning by cab. And what do you do when the cab drivers go on strike? I'll spend the day walking. I can hardly stay in that university commune since I'm not a student. If you're not a student, what am I? Oh shit, Sophia, have it your way. Stay here and read about it when the books start coming out. You're a gem, Tina. Don't let the cab leave without me. The three of us went to the revolution by taxi. We got out in front of Ted's print shop, or rather the cooperative print shop started by Ted. Tina snapped at me for calling it Ted's. Sabina went inside with Tina while I waited outside. Young people rushed in and rushed out with stacks of papers, talking excitedly. When Tina came back, she told me Ted was out, probably arguing with hospital officials to get Tissy released. Sabina had decided to stay in the print shop and wait for Ted to return. I leaned against the building wall. Sophia, what's the matter? You're trembling, Tina observed. I'm frightened. Frightened of what? This is what you dreamed about for all those years. I know, but I never dreamed what I'd do if it actually happened. You're such a baby. Come on, I'll hold your hand. We've got work to do. Sorry you brought me, I asked. No, I'm glad. If you can do it, anyone can. Tina pulled me toward the main classroom building, the building in which I had attended most of my university lectures. As soon as I saw the building, I knew that something big had already taken place, that this was no mere picnic like the general strike which I had attended with Damon. The main classroom building is transformed in ways I would have thought imaginable when I took classes here. 
black flags, red flags, and even a few black and red flags hang out the windows. Posters, banners, and painted slogans cover every inch of wall space. Over the main entrance, there's a single word in enormous, beautiful letters, liberated. Tina was more familiar with the building than I had been when I had studied there. She took me to what had been the main lecture hall, a large auditorium that had sometimes been used for performances of plays or movies. The sign above the doorway now says General Assembly. It was fuller than I had ever seen it. All the seats were taken. People sat on the steps and leaned on the walls. I heard statements about factory occupations and about extending communication. I couldn't make much sense out of the discussion, and Tina didn't give me a chance to concentrate. A young man who I've come to know quite well during the past week, Pat Klesig, walked towards Tina with a box full of leaflets. Tina grabbed a large stack and handed me a smaller one. Have them pass down the aisles on this side and make sure everyone gets one, she whispered. I nervously carried out my first task. The meeting ended at about the time I ran out of leaflets. Suddenly I was lost in a sea of people. I looked frantically for Tina as I followed the crowd out of the auditorium. One person walked up to me and pointing to the leaflet I had just given out asked me, This is a real gas. Do you work there? I shook my head stupidly. I hadn't even read the leaflet. I was so relieved to see Tina and Pat waiting outside the auditorium that I ran toward them. Sophia, this is Pat Klesik, the only person I've met of my age who knows as much as you or Sabina. Pat grinned immodestly as he shook my hand. Tina told me you were one of her best friends. I also told him you were a little nutty. I hope you don't mind. I've got to run. He'll show you where things are. I felt lost without Tina. I studied the spectacled 18-year-old boy who looked like a premature professor, and I couldn't feel any confidence in him. Are you going to show me what to do? Obviously not, Miss Nachello. Are you Tina's sister, or are you really just her friend? Almost her sister, but call me Sophia, and I won't have to explain. What do you mean by obviously not? Tina just said, no one is going to show you what to do, Sophia. But I've just gotten here. We've all just gotten here. Most of us came because there aren't any supervisors or leaders here to tell us what to do. I was terribly embarrassed. I didn't mean my question the way it sounded. But I'm lying. I did mean it. All of life I've dreamed of the day when people would make their own decisions, yet I've never in my life made my own decisions. Obviously not. People in a slave society reproduce their own slavery, but there are moments when they stop doing that. This is one of those moments. I hope so. Can you at least show me where things are? Bathroom is over there. Beds on the fourth and fifth floor. Food in the basement. Discussions, arguments, meetings, projects, everywhere else. Tell me one more thing. What was on the leaflet I just gave out, and what was the topic of the General Assembly meeting? You gave out the leaflet without reading it? Tina told you I was nutty. He told me the meeting I had just attended had been a gathering of students occupying the building, as well as workers from occupied factors all over the city. The General Assembly had discussed ways to extend information and encouragement to factories and other workplaces that were still functioning as before. At the very beginning of the meeting, someone had announced that the workers of the city's largest assembly plant had just gone on a wildcat strike, had locked up the plant manager and several foremen and occupied the plant, and that several of them were present at the meeting and ready to do whatever was necessary to extend the occupations. As a first step, it was decided that news of the wildcat was to be carried to every corner of the city. Workers from the assembly plant, accompanied by Tina, Pat, and several of their friends who'd learned to print, went to the co-op to print their announcement. Tina had gone to fetch Sabina and me while the leaflets were being printed. Meanwhile, Pat learned that a very dramatic event had taken place at the General Assembly meeting. A member of a political sect had given a speech calling for picket lines and demonstrations to support the wildcatting assembly plant workers. He had been applauded, but then one of the strikers had given a speech explaining that the picket lines and demonstrations would only attract the police, whereas what was needed was wildcat strikes and occupations everywhere. We don't want demonstrations called by politicians. We don't want picket lines manned by politicians. We understand that such tactics are maneuvers through which politicians tie their ropes around our necks. He'd gotten a standing ovation. Someone had shouted, hang the politicians with the guts of the capitalists. At that point, the politician who had given the speech as well as all the rest of his organization had angrily walked out of the auditorium, while everyone else in the room applauded and cheered wildly. Someone shouted after them, disband, that'll be your greatest political act. After the politicians had left, the General Assembly had resolved to create organs for the dissemination of information about the occupations. Tina and I had walked in while the final details of that resolution were being worked out. While listening to Pat, I had followed him up the stairs to the third floor. People rushed past us in couples and groups, all laughing, arguing, shouting. Wherever I looked, there were posters, announcements, graffiti. On the doors of former classrooms were the names of factories, of those factories that were already occupied. 
Pat stopped in front of a room with two signs, workers' councils above and below that, occupations information. It was full of people. He started to go in. Do you know anyone in there, I asked him. I don't think so, why? What are you going to do in there, I asked uneasily. I haven't the vaguest idea. Feeling reassured, I went in with him. The atmosphere was tense. Someone was saying, we've had the support of students before, twice, and we were had both times. I know this is something different, but the others aren't convinced. Pat whispered for a long time with the person next to him. When he was through, I nudged him and he pulled me out of the room. He told me that during the past year, workers at a nearby office machine plant had gone on two wildcat strikes. Both times they'd been supported by students who belonged to political sects, and both times the student politicians had been advertised in the city newspapers as leaders of the strike while wildcatting workers had lost their job. When we went back in, the office machine worker was asking how many of the people in the room were willing to go to her plant the following morning to talk to her fellow workers about the occupations. More than half the people there raised their hand, including Pat. I didn't budge. It was agreed that those willing to go would meet in that room at five the next morning. As everyone walked out of the room, I clung to Pat. Can I go with you in the morning? That's not up to me, Sophia. I'll be here at five. So will I. I walked up to the fourth floor, peered into each of the classrooms that had been converted to a bedroom, and went on to the fifth floor. I had expected one dormitory room to be for men, the other for women. But each single room was mixed. I walked dizzily from one door to the next until I recognized a young woman I had just seen in the workers' council room, which we later called the council office. I sat down on the unoccupied mattress next to hers and asked if anyone had an alarm clock to wake me up before five the next morning. She told me everyone in the room would be up before five. The following morning, a large crowd of sleepy people was gathered in front of the council office, including Pat, as well as my new roommate. I clung to Pat as we all walked to the office machine plant. He was much friendlier to me than he had been the previous day. He talked excitedly all the way to the plant. He told me about the beginning of the occupations of the university, the creation of the commune, the first occupations in factories. He convinced me that people all over the city had started to act on their own, without instructions from leaders without orders from any apparatus whatever, even their own apparatus, the union. When we reached the plant gate, Pat walked up to a woman who seemed to be Louisa's age and told her, we'd like to talk to you about the occupations. I'd like nothing better, the woman said, as if she'd expected Pat to say exactly what he said. I'll be in the restaurant across the street at noon with several others who've got hundreds of questions to ask, and you'd better be there. Pat and I had breakfast in the restaurant across the street and stayed there drinking coffee until noon. The woman Pat had spoken to came in with five other women. They pushed two tables together and motioned for us to join them. As soon as we were all seated, one of the women turned to me and with a hostility that immediately angered me asked, Wasn't this for you, dearie? Who are you with? Who sent you? Who's behind all this? I snapped, What's in it for me is intense personal satisfaction. This is probably the biggest thing that's happened to me in my whole life. No one sent me except myself and I'm not at all with anyone except my friend Pat. If someone were behind all this, I'd never have gotten up before five in the morning. Other women asked questions. I answered, and I continued answering during the entire lunch hour. Before they returned to work, one of the women suggested, Why don't you two come to the union hall tomorrow night? Lots of people would like to hear what you've got to say. I said, If we go to the union hall, then the union is going to be behind all this. At my house then, the woman said, giving us her address. We had lunch with the same woman again the next day, and at night we met with a large number of office machine workers at the house of the woman who'd given us her address. People continually bombarded me with questions, most of them insulting and many repetitious, and I continued responding, angrily and with injured pride, that no one had sent me, that I was on my own for the first time in my life. Pat was surprisingly quiet. He mainly supplied factual information of which I was ignorant. As we walked back to the former classroom building that second night, Pat grinned and told me, you're really good. What did you do before this? Were you in any organization? I told him I had never been in an organization, but had once taken part in a vast uprising, something like a revolution, 20 years ago, with you. We spent the following day arranging a meeting with a different group of workers from the same plant. Between our sessions with the workers, Pat and I talked to each other uninterruptedly about everything. When we were alone, he did most of the talking. At first, I found him altogether incomprehensible. He uses expressions like desublimation of eros and supersession of alienated being as if they were part of everyday language. Gradually I realized he was merely expressing my own goals with a language he'd borrowed from a newer radical literature than the one I had read. I shouldn't say my own goals so matter-of-factly, 
since that makes me seem terribly wise while it makes him seem unoriginal. He does express several things that are new to me. For example, he doesn't only talk about putting an end to coercion, to external physical repression, but also to internal coercion, self-repression, the repression of one's own desires. Yet his behavior conflicts with everything he says about desires. He's a perfectly proper, completely serious young man. I actually doubt that he's ever personally experienced the desires that he describes at such great length. Once I asked him if he ever thought of sex, he answered, Obviously, erotic play will occupy a central place in the disalienated Gemeinschaft. He said it without a trace of personal involvement, with the detachment of a philosophy professor talking about Plato's cave. But I like him. I liked him from the moment he said, Obviously not, to my request to show me what to do. For four days we were together from early morning until late at night, and I found myself drawn to him like a negative magnet is drawn to a positive. I listened to everything he told me as attentively as I had listened to you twenty years ago. I became something like his political apprentice. Yet there's something perverse in my feelings towards Pat, and I'm ashamed to write about that because I'm ashamed to experience such feelings in myself. Already on the first morning when we went together to the office machine plant, I felt my heart jump to my throat as soon as I saw him. Yes, I'm drawn to him as I was once drawn to you, because he seems so clear-headed and determined, because he seems to know so much about what's happening around us. But I'm also drawn to him as I was to Ron and to Jose when I lived in the garage. This is the feeling I don't understand. I loved you. I loved Ron and Jose. But I know I don't love Pat. I admire him the way one admires acrobats or certain freaks. I don't respect him. All I feel towards him is what he talks about so much, desire. I listened so attentively to everything he said because every word he spoke excited me physically, sexually. The reason I felt ashamed was because my excitement wasn't accompanied by love or even warmth toward him, but by an irrepressible desire to pull him down from the heights of his abstraction. I was excited by the desire to humiliate him. I felt like tearing his clothes off his body in order to tear those abstractions out of his head. What excited me was the prospect of raping the boy genius, the prospect of physically overcoming that pure intellect who simultaneously attracted, intimidated, and repelled me. I felt ashamed as soon as I began to suspect the nature of my desire. I've never felt that way toward anyone. So condescending, contemptuous, authoritarian. In fact, I had thought myself incapable of that kind of feeling, although Hugh once accused me of behaving as if I felt that way towards everyone. Fortunately, I was able to get out of the situation that stimulated my perverse desire before I felt compelled either to repress it or to act on it. The office machine workers went on strike three days ago. When I first heard of this, I thought with some pride that my talks might have contributed something to this decision, but I was deflated a few hours later when two of the women I had talked to told me they had opposed the strike until the very last moment. They had joined it only out of solidarity with the majority. That day and the whole next day, there was a festive atmosphere here, in the entire building. In the council office, that was when it acquired this name, it was decided that leaflets, announcements, and all other bits of information about strikes and occupations everywhere in the city were to be kept in that room, and at least one person was to remain there during all hours of the day to help people find the information they were looking for. I was the first to volunteer for that assignment, and I've been in this room 16 hours a day since the day before yesterday. I volunteered for two reasons. I wanted to find time to write you, and I wanted to get away from Pat until I'd had a chance to clarify my feelings toward him. I've seen him twice since then, at our evening meetings, and on both occasions I sat some distance away from him. Yesterday evening, after a meeting with two postal workers who asked eagerly about their occupations, I left the office briefly and telephoned Louisa. I told her exactly what Tina had told Sabina and me. It's happening, Louisa. What you've always looked forward to. Where are you? For the past day and a half, I've been in an office that disseminates information about the occupations. Sounds exciting. Did Damon ever find you? He told me he'd been trying to find out where you were going to do after losing your last job. There was no answer at your house for several days, so he thought you and Sabina had both been kidnapped. Couldn't he guess where we were? What's he been doing? He's been staying home since his classes were called off, Louisa said, without a trace of irony. His classes called off? His whole world's been called off? The hypocritical jackass. Sophia, he tried to reach you because he thought you might need his help finding another job. He's the one who'll need help pretty soon. What about you, Louisa? There are millions of things to do here, and there's lots of room for you to stay overnight. Sophia, you know perfectly well I'd lose my job if I left right now. So what? Tina simply walked off her job and told us, they'll miss me in about a week and then they'll get someone else. I'm not Sabina's daughter. I'll join you as soon as the union calls a strike in my plant. 
The union, Louisa, where have you been? Don't tell me you still think it's not a strike unless the union calls it. Would you mind calling me back when you're less hysterical, Sophia? I hung up, but almost immediately I felt bad about having done that. I remember that neither Sabina nor I had jumped up with glee when Tina had first told us about the commune and the occupations. Maybe I was unintentionally getting even with Louisa for having made me feel so old. The two postal workers who came to the council office yesterday were here again today. They came to get a second and larger collection of leaflets. They told me that mail carriers, drivers, clerks, and other postal workers had spent the day talking about striking. I can't believe it. But in case it does happen, please send your next letter to the following address across the border. I'll manage to get it from there. I hope that cab drivers don't go on strike before I have a chance to go home to see if we've already written a letter. Right now I'm alone in the council office. It almost looks like an empty classroom. I'm using the professor's desk to write this letter. I'm waiting for other workers to walk in. Workers from unoccupied factories, from other cities, from other continents. I'm waiting for you to walk into the council office. I love you, Sophia.